Papers, got papers? Papers, papers, papers. Okay. Have you got Bible verses? No. No, no Bible verses. All right. Bible verses. Thank you. Okay, good. Got one? All right. In case Gene comes. Yeah, we uh, we finished 37. We're on 38, but uh, all we did really in 38 was we looked at a few of the Bible passages and kind of yacked about it a little bit. Let's uh, we'll finish that up. Um. So, without further ado, let's go back to those Bible passages for lesson 38. Uh, first one there, Matthew. Uh, remember that. Uh, in a proper interpretation, uh, Jesus is speaking not only to Peter, but to really all Christians, all believers. So all believers have the keys of the kingdom. That is, any believer can forgive the sins of any other believer. Now, the only difference is when you are acting uh, in public, that is, if you're talking about a general absolution or something, that has to be based on, or your authority needs to come from the church. That is Christ's uh, a gift or Christ's uh, authority uh, given to the church. Okay? So again, that's where this passage comes in. Christ is speaking to all believers. So if you're, if you're all the thing is, if you're serving, uh, or if you're doing something in uh, the public eye, then that needs to be uh, done uh, on behalf of the church. Uh, and then the same thing in, in Matthew 18, it's both a, an individual application, but also a wider application, so that if, an individ if this is between two individuals, which is the case in, in many cases, uh, and that's really what Jesus is using as the main example here. Um, the only time the church gets involved is, as he says, a person refuses to listen. So uh, you have got a situation where a person offends you, does something wrong to you, or simply does something wrong in general, or perhaps does something wrong in a in a way that causes a, a, a bad witness uh, to come upon Christianity, something along those lines, then you have, the, again, the right, you have the authority to speak to that person. You go to that person privately and you say, hey, I saw you do such and such, or I heard you say such and such, you need to fix that. You need to take that back. You need to tell people that were around that you were wrong, and so on and so forth. Uh, the person says, uh, I'm not going to do that, or I don't agree with you, or what I said was perfectly fine. Then you uh, go to a couple other people, tell them the event, go back. The uh, person says, I don't care what you guys say. Then, uh, as Jesus says here, you tell it to the church. You give it to the grouping of believers. And then the grouping of believers deals with the person, and if the person again refuses to uh, uh, listen, then uh, you know, treat them as though they're an unbeliever because they're acting like an unbeliever. This, that, here again, this does not mean they are, but you are to treat them that way. In other words, you, are, you, are, you can't read hearts, but you're reading actions, and the actions describe or, or uh, the actions seem to indicate that this person is an unbeliever. And so that's what you have to go on. You don't have anything else to go on. You can't, you can't read their hearts. You can't read their minds. So you make an assumption based upon their deeds or lack of deeds, as the case may be. Uh, again, Matthew 28, there's the authority passage once again. I give you authority to do this, Jesus says. You are to preach of the gospel. Now, the gospel includes, of course, forgiveness. It includes absolution. That is a big part of the gospel. As I mentioned in the newsletter, uh, 
a lot of Lutherans don't see it as a sacrament, but the confessions call it a sacrament. Mark uh, 115, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe. This is law and gospel, sin and grace, uh, uh, sin and absolution, if you will, confession and absolution, if you will. Um, preach the gospel to all creatures. Once again, same thing. Forgive sins, withhold sins. Withhold forgiveness, give forgiveness. Uh, and then John 20, uh, once again, we have the uh, uh, an, uh, authority passage uh, where he says, uh, I give you, okay, I'm sending you. Uh, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. Again, note the uh, verbal tense here. Very important, and it gets skipped over. I, I've heard many, many sermons on this, and most of them don't really talk about this at all. You never hear it mentioned. Most translations do not bring out the true uh, verbal sense of the Greek. Have been forgiven. You, you name uh, uh, to someone, you say to someone, uh, you, you are forgiven, that has, all you are doing is you are repeating something that has already been done. Okay? It's already been done. So, and, and so that really you're not the one doing it, obviously, then. You're not uh, forgiving sins. You are proclaiming the forgiveness of sins that has already been purchased and won by Jesus on the cross. And if you withhold sins, then what you're basically saying is this person is an unbeliever. Now, the sin is paid for, yes, but the person himself does not believe it's forgiven because they don't believe it's a sin. How can you have forgiveness of sins if you don't think you've sinned? <laughs> see, see, that's what you're saying. That's why it says they have been. In other words, in time, God knows, in eternity, God knows that this person is not a believer. God knows that this person does not consider their sin forgiven because they don't consider to have sinned in the first place. Or they refuse to accept the fact that Jesus paid for their sin whether it's refusing to accept Jesus as the Savior, or whether it's refusing to accept His sacrifice as covenant for sin. If, for example, they are work righteous, if they're a, a cult member, let's say like a Mormon, for example, uh, who, who doesn't even believe Jesus is God, but, but assuming, assuming they're uh, ignorant and they do assume Jesus is God, again, uh, they're trying to earn their way uh, into heaven, and therefore they are denying uh, the forgiveness of sins uh, uh, that you pronounced to them. Right? Uh, I've had this argument with many Mormons over the years. Uh, Mormons who attend uh, for one reason or another, uh, show up at church sometimes uh, with relatives or friends or whatever, you know. And how can and this is what, how can you stand up there and say I forgive you all of your sins? That's a terrible thing, you know. And I said, well, it's not me speaking, it's God speaking. You know, well, we don't accept that. Well, all right then. Then, then this passage is, is, is uh, uh, perfectly accurate. Your sins have not been forgiven in the past. In other words, God in eternity saw that you would reject. So uh, the verbal tenses here, folks, are very, very often quite important and, and don't nearly get the attention that they deserve. And that's sad, really too bad. Uh, and, and uh, it, you know, nowadays, I, I was thinking about this just, just this afternoon or this morning. Uh, I was working on a, a project for my, uh, for my next circuit meeting, our next circuit meeting. And, uh, you know, I, any, any, any person today can go online, can go on the Internet and, and uh, find uh, Greek uh, text, can find uh, translations, very literal translation, can find discussions of every single Greek word in the New Testament. If you want to, you can know as much or more than anybody who ever graduated from a seminary, ever, if you want to. You can, you can educate yourself. As a matter of fact, you can educate yourself better than uh, most of the guys sitting at desks in, in seminaries today. You really can, because you have uh, a plethora. I mean, uh, I, I pulled up one verse. Uh, there were 
20 different uh, uh, commentaries, translations, or I think 30 different translations, uh, discussions on each word, discussions on the verb tense, discussion on the other grammar, uh, discuss, discussions on the noun meanings. I mean, extensive, extensive. I, I, if I had read all that stuff, I'd still be at it today. I re, it's still right now. I mean, and I started at eight o'clock this morning. Uh, you, it, it, there is no excuse, none, absolutely no excuse for Christians today not to know exactly what the Bible says and means. And it's the same goes for Hebrew. Maybe not quite as many commentaries, not quite as many uh, grammatical discussions, but still quite a few. Still quite a few. And, and, and they're accessible to you. You don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to know anybody special. You don't have to go to a seminary. You don't have to go to a college or a university. You don't have to do any of that. Just fire up your computer and click it, put in a few clicks. Bing, you're there. So yeah, I, I just, it's just really astounding. And, and yet, with that, all that information at our fingertips, the, the in translations and the interpretations uh, of Scripture are getting worse, not better. <laughs> uh, they are. Uh, sermons, you, you read some sermons online, watch some sermons on YouTube or whatever, they're terrible. They mess up simple things like this. Simple things. So, yeah, it, it's just, it's really amazing what, what's available today. Uh, Peter, uh, writing here, a chosen royce or royal priesthood, holy nation. So, uh, again, we are priests, we are kings, we are prophets. Certainly Jesus had the triple office, prophet, priest, and king, but so do we. And by the authority of him, uh, uh, himself. Uh, we speak His Word, we absolve in His name, just like a priest would. Uh, we are uh, royalty, part of God's family. Uh, all of that uh, is true. So that's where the authority comes from for the Yisr. Yeah, how do we determine which one is the actual? Well, I, I, I meant 20, uh, not, not necessarily 20 uh, interpretations, but, but uh, 20 examples or, or 20, uh, um, 20 people writing. Uh, and of those interpretations, say, you know, there'll be three or four main points that each one brings up. But they, they just bring it up in different ways, you know, using different language or, or maybe different analogies or, or, or whatever. I'm not, I'm not saying there's that many interpretations. I'm just saying that, that uh, uh, for, for, a, for a particular passage, you know, I'll go back to these verses again. Um, let's, let's say, for example, okay, let's just take the first one, okay? J Jesus talking to Peter, okay? Now, again, you can find on Matthew 16, 19, I bet you, you could find two dozen uh, different uh, commentaries, two, different, two, two dozen different authors who will write four sentences or four pages on, on that passage, right? But when it comes to categorizing their interpretation, you're going to have the Roman uh, interpretation, which is this is Peter, and this is Jesus making Peter the first pope, which cannot stand grammatical inspection, that, that interpretation, or the Protestant interpretation, Luther's interpretation, and, and other Protestants, which, which say, no, uh, Jesus is speaking to all believers. And in that particular instance, directly to the uh, 12 apostles. So, uh, uh, that's what I meant. Yeah, well, I, I, and that's where I was coming from, too, is I, I kind of figured that you must know who writes in the Lutheran theme. Uh, right. From this. But, but again, you could do that. It, it, <coughs> even if you, if you were not a member of this church, you did not know me, you had never heard anything, you were just reading that in the Bible, you could go to, you know, a Greek New Testament in the, in the, in the Internet. 
and, and, and put in Matthew 16, 19. And it would tell you that I will give you, okay, before that, verse 18, uh, you are Peter, okay? You meaning, you would be singular there. You are Peter. From now on, uh, you, you will be called Peter, okay? Right? So that's singular. And then upon you, plural. Now, any, any decent uh, uh, website on, on the Greek uh, New Testament would tell you the first one is singular, the second one is plural. And that tells you right there. You can't be talking about Peter. Okay? And, and in, uh, you know, you it'll also find out uh, you, you, okay, you are, you are, uh, you are Peter. Uh, you, you are, you are the rock. Okay, uh, but it doesn't really. It, there, there's two different kinds of rock in Greek, and there's two different words used there. Okay, you, you, you would a good translation would be, you are a solid foundation, Peter, or, or you are, you are a, uh, or maybe better, no, the first one would be, you are a blockhead. You're a stubborn guy. You, you know, in other words, you're you're you got a thick head. But upon this solid foundation, different kind of rock, which is what Peter said, you are Christ, the Son of the Living God. And 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 Jesus said, You did not come to this by your own self. You did not come to this understanding, but it was revealed to you. Okay. Any decent Greek grammar, and they're all online now, they're all, every single one of them are on the internet, Any, anyone will tell you what that means. And you would be able, whether you knew me or whether you were into a Lutheran church or not, you would be able to translate that correctly. You, Simon, are a rockhead. It's not going to be easy to blast anything out of your head. Once you get your mind set on something, you're going to be a tough nut to crack. But now upon all you guys, and upon this, what you said, Christ, the Son of the living God, that's a solid foundation, and that's what I build my church on, and the gates of hell will not prevail against that. You could do that all by yourself these days. Maybe 100 years ago not. Maybe 50 years ago even not. But today, anybody can do that. All you need, all you need to do is read. All you, all you need to do is look, and you can find it. So that's my point. That's my point. It, 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 and even though it has gotten easier and easier and easier to prove these things, uh, the, the church is worse and worse and worse off because nobody is putting in the effort. Even though the effort is right there in front of you, all you've got to do is move your fingers. You don't got to get up and go to class. You don't got to find a seminary. You don't got to pay any fees to get in. You don't got to put a suit and tie on like we had to do to go to Sam and sit there in the classroom. Uh, you, you didn't have to drive on frozen highways uh, in the middle of January, okay? Because all the seminaries are up there in crazy cheese land, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, you, you, you don't have to do that, guys. You don't have to do any of that. You can be in your recliner with your laptop on your lap, you know, petting your dog or your cat or whatever, you know, and have a little beer, you know, and, and, and uh, have the golf match in, in the background. And just a few strokes of your fingers, do, 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 boom, here's all this information. It's, again, pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages. You can know anything you want to know. Anything you want to know. That, that's, not, that's my point, see. And, and so what God, what God has allowed is this, this, this very thing, this holy nation, this royal priesthood, it, it, it really is more true today than it ever has been before. It really is. Uh, uh, the, the information, is, you know, when they say, oh, this is the information age. Yup, yeah, it, it is. It really is. 
so yeah, uh, that, that that's what I'm talking about here. It's just really kind of amazing uh, uh, that things are so much worse, and people's interpretations are so much worse. They're very bad, and and they're they're uh, they're, they're not they're they're not they don't make any sense. Uh, it's so surprising when you have all this information there, and they either refuse to use it or refuse to believe it. Or just refuse to just they just refuse to find it and refuse to think about it. You know <laughs> that that's the problem. Let's look at the questions. Um, lesson thirty-eight: Holy Absolution, the Office of the Keys, the sole duty of the church and their prerogative, that is their uh, uh, their privilege, if you will, uh, to proclaim the gospel and declare heaven open to all. That see, that's another point. Heaven is open to all. You don't have to be special. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to belong to a club. You don't have to be a special race or job or whatever. Heaven is open to all because all sins have been paid for. That's our job. That's it. We don't have another job. We're not put on, the church is not put, nowhere does Jesus say that the church is put here to feed the hungry or clothe the naked or house the homeless. Nowhere, not a single verse. Yes, those verses are said by Jesus to believers individually. Yes, you betcha. Jesus tells believers individually, yes, you should give of your money and your time, and your effort, and your water, and your clothes, and your home, and your roof. Yes, Jesus does say that, and so do the apostles. But not one single solitary verse anywhere does Jesus or the apostles say the church should do that. Now, I grant you, it's difficult for individuals to do that sometimes. And it is easier and perhaps more efficient sometimes, for a group to do that. Fine. But, but understand that it's not the job of that group, the church. It's not the job of the church. Now, if the individual members of the church band together and say, well, we want to do this, fine. But be sure, be sure that the preach the gospel is being done in every way as much as it possibly can. And that anything else, whether it's a soup kitchen or a food pantry or a homeless shelter or anything else you do, is done after and beyond preaching the gospel. It has to be second. has to be. Or third, fourth, fifth, whatever. That goes with anything. That goes with anything, anything. That goes with building buildings. That goes with running schools. Okay? I always told my congregations uh, when they came up, uh, when I got here 20 some odd years ago, but, but also in El Paso and Broadhead and, and in Las Cruces, I always told my congregations, you know, they said, oh, we should, we should plan to open up a day school. We should plan to open a parochial school. And I always said the same thing. Wonderful, you do that. After, after we have exhausted every opportunity to do that, preach the gospel. After we have uh, uh, used our money and our time and our effort and everything else to do everything we possibly can to preach the gospel to the neighbors and, and to the community and to our own members, of course, and you still have money left over, and you still have time left over, and you still have energy left over, fine. Then you can start a school, or a food pantry, or a soup kitchen, or a homeless shelter, or anything else that you want to do. Fine. After you do the other thing. And for some strange reason, that is a heresy in a lot of churches. For some odd, weird reason, somehow that is just not accepted. Oh no, we can do 10 things at once. 
Well, yeah, I guess. If you have all the money in the world, you know, you got a thousand members and your mortgage is paid off and everything else, and, uh, you, you know, you, you, you're putting out, uh, you know, radio, TV ads all over the place and your people are going door to door, knocking on doors, and you're putting out mailers on every door handle and you're doing, and you're doing all those things. Okay, fine. But, but somehow or other, it's like, no, 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 we can do that stuff later. We want to have a nice building, and we want to have a nice school, and boy, we want to have all these people, you know, uh, school is a big money-making deal, see? Now they charge tuition. You know, they didn't use charge tuition when I was a kid. When I went to parochial school, and I went two years, uh, but when I went to parochial school, they didn't charge tuition. You didn't, you didn't, nobody charged tuition. And, and I mean, this was across the board. This was any church you want to look at. The Missouri Synod, Wisconsin Synod, uh, any, any, you know, any town in Wisconsin, here, Arizona, wherever. Well, they didn't charge any tuition. Charge any tuition. Oh, what? You're a member of the church, your kid went. If your kid didn't want to go or you didn't want your kid to go, fine, dandy. If you're not a member of the church, okay, then you might have been charged tuition. But even then, most of the time not. Then all of a sudden it became a big money-making deal. And now churches are dependent on it. You can't run a, a, a school, a church, church school. You can't run a church school now without charging tuition and without charging a lot. And this is wrong. I always get a kick. I always get a kick out of these people, you know, who say, oh, but this is a gospel ministry because because the gospel is, is talked about in math class and English class and all the other classes. Okay, it's gospel ministry. And then I say to him, do you charge for sermons? Do you charge for sermons? Do you, do you charge for people to come in and worship? Do you, do you have somebody at the, at the gate, right, taking tickets? That's a gospel ministry, right? Well, how come you don't charge for that? How come you charge for gospel ministry when you're teaching gospel along with the algebra, but you don't charge uh, money uh, when people want to come in and, and uh, sing hallelujah? Mm -hmm. Well, that's different. What well, is? Well, explain to me how that's different. I would really like to know. Dead silence. Well, then how do you justify charging people for the gospel ministry in algebra when you don't charge them for the gospel ministry in the hallelujah. Mm -hmm. How do you justify that? Well, we need that in order to pay the teachers. Oh, in other words, your congregation is not uh, convinced enough uh, of the need for this uh, school thing uh, to come up with the money to, to pay them anyway. Well, then you've got a problem, don't you? You need to do some more convincing before you start. Well, if we do that, we would never start. Ah, isn't that interesting? Crazy. It's crazy. What one great task did Jesus Christ give his church on earth? Preach the gospel right there. Preach the gospel. Nothing else. Nothing else. Not put together synods. Not build seminaries. Now, you can say, well, we need those things so we can preach the gospel. Do you really? Do you really? Maybe, but maybe not. That's a matter of opinion. I have become convinced, the matter of the, the, as a matter of uh, my opinion is, you don't need any of that stuff. You don't need a center headquarters building, and you haven't for the last 20, 30 years. You don't need a seminary. You don't need a college. You don't need area Lutheran high schools. You don't need day schools. You don't need any of that stuff. All that stuff does is detract from that right there. That's what it does. It makes that 10 times harder than it already is. But we are so stuck in that paradigm of organization, okay? headquarters, denomination, and presidents, and administrators, and bureaucrats, and pencil pushers, and paperclip counters, and all the kind of suits. And we're so used to that, and we're so used to long wings of school rooms, and, and bell towers, and you know, all that kind of, we're so used to all that. That's what we're used to. And so we, it's 
doesn't even occur to us to question that stuff anymore. And when somebody does question it, get thee hence, Satan. Get behind me. How dare you say that? What's the most important aspect of this task for sinful souls? I say uh, the absolution and or the forgiveness. Uh, and and uh, un no strings attached, I would say. Uh, that's the most important thing for sinful souls. For sin what you want to know, what you want to know is that your sin is paid for. What you want to know is that God forgives you. That's what you want to know. And you want, you want no strings. You don't want to if the ifs, ands, and buts. You don't want the, somebody to say, well, yeah, God forgives you if. You give plenty in the collection plate. God forgives you if you sit and fill the pews every Sunday. God forgives you if uh, you support our uh, soup kitchen. God forgives you if uh, you send your kids to parochial school. God forgives you if. You don't want to hear that. That's not going to help your sinful soul. Your sinful soul is not going to be comforted by that. Because you're always going to ask yourself, have I done enough? Yeah. According to Christ's own command, how is this task to be carried out? Top priority. The sole reason and purpose for the existence of a congregation. Preach the gospel. First to its own people, then to unchurched. That's it. That's how, that's how you do this. You don't let anything else interfere. If, if, if it would interfere, if, if a building would interfere, you get rid of it. Okay? Now, I'm no, I know churches with uh, two, three million dollar debts. They built themselves a nice place. And now, every council meeting, they tell me, every uh, elders meeting, every deacons meeting, whatever, every voters meeting, goes on for hours on, we're way behind, we're not able to pay our bills, uh, what are we going to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> At that point, at that point, if I was pastor there, I would say, let's go to a storefront, let's rent uh, an empty storefront uh, in the rotten part of town so the rent will be real cheap and, and, and get rid of this thing so that we can focus and concentrate on preaching the gospel. But, but I'm telling you, I've been there, I've done that. Let me tell you, if people don't want to hear that, Boy, that's the last thing people want to hear. Church that I left in El Paso, do, we were doing real good when I left. It had a tough time. Uh, and so the mission board came and they said, look, you can't afford this where you're at right now. You need to move. You can't, you can't, pay, you can't pay your bills. You need to move. You need to, you need to go someplace temporary for a while, build your, build your uh, uh, bank accounts up a little bit and that kind of thing. And you need to focus on outreach a little bit more. Uh, and and sadly, the pastor there at the time, he's a young guy right out of seminary, he didn't have the wherewithal to lead them by the nose. And so he said, oh, he said, well, I'll let the people decide. And the people said, no, we're not going to do that. And so the church closed, went out of business. Doors closed. Why? Well, because the building was more important than the mission. Yes, sir. Lord, the uh, 12 families started the church, mm -hmm. and uh, we met in the uh, school on Target. Mm -hmm. Sure. We had a portable, collapsible altar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so did we. Yeah. Six, fixed up a sedan, played a keyboard, right. a keyboard and right. fixed up a sound system, and right. that's where we met. Yep. And that church is, uh, they finally got a, a big property, and the church is sure. building 
for yep. they're doing fine yeah well you know again yeah i mean but but what happens a lot of times is is uh uh people get focused on the wrong thing and so they get focused on something material rather than the uh the message why does forgiveness apply to all people even unbelievers everybody ought to know the answer to this real easy Yep. Jesus died for all. God so loved the world that he gave the world. Okay. Why is this truth so important and essential for the church's work? Why is it essential for the church's work? What what would what, what what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Well, the alternative is Christ only died for fill in the blank group. If that was the case, then the church has to go hunting always for that group, whatever whoever that group is. And that's the only deep group we deal with. Okay? That goes with the next question. What would it mean, even for believers, if forgiveness only applied to those with saving faith? What's the problem with that? If you say that forgiveness is only with the, for those with faith, I didn't say salvation now. I said forgiveness. There's a difference. Remember that. There's a difference. All the people in hell are forgiven. I know that's kind of hard, but... That's a fact. Otherwise, what's the point of Jesus' sacrifice? So, so there's a difference. So, but what would it mean to us who have saving faith if we taught, if our belief was that Jesus died only for the believers? What, 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 what would that do to us? We're believers. Why would we care? We wouldn't care. Oh. I'm a believer. She's died for the believers. That's me. I'm in good shape. Then you have times when you don't feel like a believer, yeah. and you would think, well, I guess he didn't die. Right. You fall into some terrible sin. Huh? You're a pathological liar, or you're a kleptomaniac. And you don't just do it once. You're a kleptomaniac. You do it every day. You steal something every day. You lie every day. Little, big, what difference does it make? You lie. You prevaricate every day. What happens? Well, you start to think, well, I'm not a, I must not be a believer. Because a real believer wouldn't do that. And so if I'm not a real believer, then Jesus didn't die for my sins, and then I'm out of luck. See? That's the problem. That's the problem. I don't think there's a believer out there. And I know those famous ones like Luther or whatever who did a lot of writing and wrote about this kind of thing, but, but I don't think there's a believer out there, well, I've never met one anyway, who is so sure of his salvation that never ever in his entire life do they ever wonder or ever worry about, oh, I'm not sure if I'm a believer or not. I hear that from people all the time. Always have, my whole 40 some odd years in the ministry. I hear that all the time. I don't know, I don't feel that way. No, I don't think that. Uh, no. So if it's true that Jesus only died for the believers, we're in bad trouble, folks. See? That's, that's the problem. Why then does the Bible say that those like the unbelieving Pharisees, that they will die in their sins? Why does Jesus say that? If, if their sins have been forgiven, how is it that they can die in their sins? I don't get it, huh? Right? Have you ever said that after hearing something like that? Have you said to yourself, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. How can Jesus say to the Pharisees, you will die in your sins if he himself pays for all of their sins? Okay, well, but their non-belief doesn't make the, 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 the payment go away. So how are they going to die in their sins? Well, it's real simple, actually. 
and, and, and pastors, especially some pastors I know, make it much more difficult. But what you, could, what you can say is they will die in their minds. Because in their minds, they still have to pay for their own sins. That was the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees rejected Jesus because they said, we'll do it ourselves. You're not good enough. So, so uh, that's why the Bible says it about that. That's why Jesus says you'll die in your sins. You're going to die in your sins in your head. Eh? Or in your heart, if you will. So you don't truly believe in your mind, even though... Right. You might say, well, I confess, I believe, I believe, but yet in your mind you don't. Well, it's like saying, yeah, sure, I believe in Jesus, but then you get to heaven and, and God says, why should I let you in here? And you say... Well, because I did this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And God says, huh, what? Well, yeah, I did, I did all these things. God says, so? Well, I'm good enough. Oh, you are. Hmm. Well, sorry, you lose. You lose, yeah. You, your sins, you, you still think you have them. You, you still think you've got to pay for them. What's that? What's that all about? You're wrong. Oh no, I'm not wrong. I know I have to pay for them myself. That's the way. That's the way things work. Oh yeah, that's the, thing, the way things work on on Earth. But that's not the way I put the plan of salvation together. Well, I don't care. I'm going to pay for them myself. Oh, you do. Okay, fine. Enjoy hell. <laughs> Be my guest. You know that the saying about God doesn't send anybody to hell. They go on their own. Uh, uh, go by themselves. They go, you know. They go willingly. That's true. That is true. They go willingly. Now, I, I, you can take it too far, you know. Yeah, of course, God sends people to hell. Yeah, He does. But why? Well, because they insist. <laughs> they insist. I got to pay for my own sins. Well, the Bible says the payment for sin is death, which is eternal death. Fine. You want to you want to you want to pay the price for your own sins, eternal death. Go right ahead. Who am I to stop you? I mean, you always you always telling me I don't answer prayer. Okay, fine. I okay, fine. I answer your request. There you go. You want to pay for it? Result then. Go ahead. Enjoy. I mean, it's that simple, folks. It really is. I I, I don't I don't think people really comprehend it. But that's exactly what's going on. You know, I'm sure we have friends and relatives and people that we know that don't take God seriously anymore. Uh, most of the world doesn't take God seriously anymore. Uh, you know, and, and while uh, certainly their sins are, are obvious in many cases, uh, that's not the real problem. The real problem is they just don't take it serious anymore. The, the real problem is they really don't care. The real problem is you know, if, if they say, well, I'm going to hell, uh, big deal. That's that's the real problem, if you ask me. That's the real problem. You know, and, and it, people have asked me, well, how come how come all our outreach doesn't do any good around here? Well, the soil is real rocky around here, real rocky. It's like hundred percent granite. Why is that? Oh, I don't know exactly. It just is, uh, and these this people are just people. Just don't take God seriously. They just don't. They they just they just don't. Going to hell does not scare anybody. People are a lot more scared of nuclear war right now than they are of going to hell. They're much more scared of Putin pushing the red button than they are of uh, Jesus showing up on the horizon and and calling. You know, uh, calling quits to everything and, and and having the day of judgment. They're not afraid of the day of judgment. They're afraid of they're afraid of the day of Armageddon, but they're not afraid of the day of judgment. It doesn't bother them at all. Going to hell, facing Jesus, facing God. I thought it did. I thought that's why I thought that's why all these people were afraid of uh, COVID. I really did. I thought, well, they're all afraid of COVID. They're all they don't want to die. They don't want to face God. But I decided. No, it's actually worse than that. 
It really is. It's actually worse than that. It's not that they're afraid of uh, dying uh, and, and facing God. It's afraid. It's that they're uh, terrified of dying and and missing out on fun, uh, missing out on joy, missing out on food, missing out on sex, missing out on drink, missing out on whatever. Fill in the blank. Missing out on going, taking your buggy out to the sand dunes, Miss, missing out on going fishing, missing out on uh, rafting. Uh, missing out on going to uh, Yellowstone and hiking the trails. You're missing out on uh, going to Yosemite, uh, etc. Fill in the blank. I, I've become convinced uh, after the, in the last two years. Uh, I started out thinking, oh, wow, well, everybody's running around wearing masks and everything because they don't want to face God. Boy, was I wrong. Because if that was true, if people really were scared of dying and facing God, those pews in there would be packed to the rafters. And so would every other church, Lutheran or otherwise, in the entire country. Attendance would be through the roof if people were scared of going to hell. But they're not. The proof is because attendance is worse now than it was even before the pandemic. And now it's showing no signs, none, of getting better. Zero. And so it couldn't be that these people are afraid of God, or it couldn't be that they're afraid of going to hell. No, it can't be. What they're afraid of is missing out on life. Now, I grant you, life can be pleasant and fun and games and everything like that, but that, that's it. That's what they're afraid of. They don't want to die because they just don't want to die. It has nothing to do with God. <laughs> Dummy me. What was I thinking? I know a lot of pastors thinking the same thing. Where's everybody? Wondering how come our people haven't come back to church yet after two years and after all the mass mandates are gone. But people are still not back. I know, pastors and I, other well, the pastors and I talk about it all the time. And where is everybody? And, and I said, well, obviously they're not very afraid of going to hell. They're sure not afraid of God. What else could they be afraid of? And, and so I said, well, they're afraid I'm missing out on life. That's as simple as that. They're afraid I'm missing out on life. They don't want to die. They want the fun and games. They want the party to continue. Simple as that. Now, if that's what we're up against as far as preaching the gospel, then preaching the gospel itself is not going to do the trick. We're going to have to preach the law, too. We're going to have to finally try and convince people that hell exists, and that it's very unpleasant. And it's not something to joke about. It's not something to laugh about. It's not something to say, oh, well, no big deal. I go to hell, I go to hell. Eh. I don't want to go to heaven because heaven sounds boring. Really? You'd rather go to hell? Yeah, really, I think so. I hear people say that all the time on TV, the radio. I don't want to go to heaven. It's boring there. Bunch of holy rollers. Yeah. I'll go to hell. It's a lot more fun there. Oh, you think so, huh? They obviously think so. So it's, it's crazy. So that's how this truth applies to the church's work. The truth applies to the church's work. You've got to tell people. You gotta, everybody needs to know. Yeah, your sins have been paid for. But if you don't believe that, if you don't accept that, you're not going to get the benefits. That needs, to be, that needs to be a big part of the message. Big part of the message needs to be, you need that forgiveness. Whether you know it or not, you need it. And if you don't believe in that forgiveness. So it's really become kind of a three-part message. You need it. Here it is. You better believe it. If you don't believe it, you don't get it. Instead of, instead of simple law and gospel, sin and grace, it needs to be sin and grace. But grace has, there's limits to grace, okay? 
God's patience will run out and he will show up one of these days and all those who think they can save themselves or who have been laughing about hell and don't care, that's where they're going to wind up. And so that needs to, that needs to now be, I think, part of our message. Huh? Because people ain't getting it. You would think a couple years of plague would do it. It sure didn't. Questions on 38. 39. Holy Absolution, Part 3. The public ministry of the gospel, every congregation may administer the keys publicly. I should have said only. Only because of the believers in it. If it would be possible for a congregation to have no believers in it at all, which I don't think so, but if that's possible, then that congregation has no business absolving anybody of their sins or carrying out any of the gospel uh, work. Okay? Let's look at the passages. Passage, first passage, Luke 15. I tell you that in the same way, Jesus speaking here, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, of course, they think they need no repentance. They really do, but they think they don't. And repentance, remember, is two parts. It's contrition and turning, or sorrow and turning. Okay. Meta noyo in Greek. Meta noyo, noyo brain. Meta turn. You turn your mind. Turn your mind. You turn your mind. You're going in one direction. You turn around and go the other direction. You actually go in the other direction. You don't just turn on and stop. You turn and go. Okay. Repent means to turn and go. And this is why, and again, you don't hear this preached on much. You don't hear this said much. But, uh, you know, it's repent is thrown out there. It's like you can do it. You can no more repent correctly, biblically, than you can believe correct or biblically. That's a fact, Jack. And that's not said enough, I don't think. We sometimes preach and teach as though, okay, you repent, then God will make you a believer. So you do something. Judas had sorrow. He did not turn around. He did not believe. He did not accept the fact that Jesus would take him back. Jesus would have taken him back. Jesus would have made him an apostle again, just like he did Peter. I mean, I've said before, and I'll say it again, whose traitor, whose treachery was worse, Judas's or Peter's? I say Peter's, by far, was worse than Judas's. You say, well, Judas turned him into the authority. Big deal. The already tried to kill Jesus numerous times in his ministry. At least four or five times that we know of. Didn't do him any good until Jesus was ready to die. Right? So that doesn't mean nothing, hardly. But Peter, Jesus' best bud, you might say, maybe next to John. Okay? Peter, right? Big mouth. Peter always thought, huh? hey, you're, you're me, man. I'll go with you. I'll be with you. I'll be, I'm behind you a thousand percent. Remember when, remember when McGovern said that? Y'all remember that? Remember when McGovern said that? Who do you say that about? When McGovern was running for president in 1972, he said, he said about uh, a, a, a person, I'm behind him a hundred, a, a thousand percent. Thomas Eagleton. Eagleton was... McGovern's choice as vice president at the at the convention. And a couple of weeks into the campaign after the convention, it came out that Eagleton had had shock treatments, neuro brain brain shock treatments. And in those days, ooh, that was ooh, that was a bad thing. Okay. Um, and uh, McGovern came out and said, "Oh, it's okay. I trust him. I'm behind him a thousand percent." 
About three days later, he canned him. <laughs> he canned him. Canned his butt. Yeah. I'm behind him a thousand percent. <laughs> yeah, you're behind him already. Push him out of a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Romans 10:15 How will they preach unless they're sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to bring good news. And how are we going to do that unless we're sent? Who sends us? Well, Jesus sends us. Holy Spirit sends us. And then of course in this world it's pretty hard to do uh, mission work or any ministry for nothing. You know, uh, a lot my, our Baptist friends, uh, you know, uh, they, they you, you have a job and you do the preaching on the side until your church gets huge among us and maybe you get a full-time gig as pastor. But for the vast majority of them, all the Baptist preachers all throughout the South and the Bible Belt and everything, they, most of the small little churches, um, they're all shoe salesmen, they're all, you know, Walmart workers, they're all janitors, they're all this, they're all that, they're school teachers, they're all kinds of things. It's very, very tough in those, those churches to, to uh, unless they're, like I say, very large, hundreds and hundreds of members, it's very tough uh, to make a living being a, being a preacher, very tough. Uh, so, uh, in, in our churches, of course, uh, uh, we want the preachers to spend 100% of their time, if at all possible, uh, uh, or 80 or 90 anyway, or 75 or whatever, uh, on their ministry. And so we, pay, we give them a full-time salary. Now, full-time salary some places is different than full-time salary some other places. Okay. The average salary for Missouri Senate pastors today, uh, just typical, Congregation exactly our size for well, there are very few of them that size, but let's say a typical uh, average congregation in Missouri Senate uh, is the whole package. That is the whole package is about between 100 and 120 thousand. But that's including pension and health insurance, and you know that's including everything between 100 and 120 thousand. That's the average. Okay. Average in the wells is between 75 and about 90. Whole package. So we here are pretty average. You know, I don't think we're uh, far behind. In other words, in other words, uh, you know, you need to get a new pastor one of these days. You know, the, the package would be, I think, doable. I, I think it'd be acceptable to most guys. Uh, you know, but but what's happened in in the ministry? Uh, what's happened is that. Uh, uh, it's gotten to be a, a real hard to, to find people to put in that kind of time. Uh, what's happened is uh, the wives have all gone to work. When I was in seminary, it was told to us, our wives, our seminary wives, our pastor, pastor's wife should not ever, ever work outside the home, have a job. That's what we were told. And I'm not that, I'm not that ancient yet. I graduated in 1981. 81 I graduated in and it was still frowned upon for my wife to have a job outside of the parsonage. That changed almost overnight. By, oh, I'd say 85 or 86, it was not only not frowned upon, it was encouraged. And so what you'll find is you'll find pastors that are five to ten years older than me and, and or younger than me and, and younger still, uh, if you ask them to spend 60, 70, 80 hours a week on their ministry, which is my average week, if you, if you, you expect that, you're going to be, you, you're, you're, you're going to be disappointed. That's not going to happen. You're, you're going to be, as a matter of fact, you're going to be real lucky if the guy spends 40 hours a week. And most of my peers, uh, pastor friends, all younger guys in Tucson, if they put in 35 or 40 hours a week, I'd be shocked, most of them, except for maybe one guy that I know. The rest of them, no way. They are, they are busy. They are busy 
taking the kids to orthodontist appointments. They're busy taking the kids to soccer practice. They're busy transporting their kids to school and back. Uh, they're busy doing all kinds of other things. And therefore, they're not, they don't, they just don't have the time. They just don't have the time. They don't have, they don't have 50, 60 hours a week anymore, 70, 80 hours a week anymore to put into ministry. They just don't. So that's another thing that's happened to the church. Don't expect that. You can't expect that. If you, again, if you expect that, if you expect the next guy to put in the same time that I put in, in that little office over there, you're going to be very disappointed. You're going to be very unhappy. You're going to be very grouchy. Don't expect it. It ain't going to happen, folks. I'm telling you right now, it ain't going to happen. It's not possible anymore. And, and what's happened is, uh, uh, while you know, uh, most of my generation of pastors, uh, a lot of them were on welfare, a lot of them were on government cheese, we used to say, okay, that you don't see that anymore. And so a lot of the guys, they're used to their wives bringing in equal to their salary, if not more. In most cases, much more. And so they're living pretty nice lives. And that's what they're used to. And they're not used to government cheese anymore. And, and if you try and force them into that, they'll boogie. They'll boogie on you. They'll call up the district president, get me the age out of here. Get me away from these people. They're working me to death and they ain't paying me diddly squat. And they don't want my wife to work and da 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 and, and pretty soon you guy gets a bunch of calls and it's gone. And you're left with a nice long vacancy. Because then the word gets out, see, oh, that congregation. Ooh, man. Ooh. They expect. Ooh. They expect guys to. Ooh. Ooh. I'm not gonna follow that guy. It's a real problem. First Corinthians. God has got a, not a God of confusion and peace. So as where, where it comes to women, they are not they kept silent in the churches, they are not permitted to speak, but are subject themselves as the law says. Speaking in the sense of authority, speaking in the sense of leading in worship, leading in uh, theology, however. Okay. Second Corinthians. On the contrary, you should forgive and comfort him, otherwise one might be overwhelmed. Here's a passage that talks again, goes back about the comfort of absolution. Ephesians 4. These are some of the offices that Christ created. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Some, some translations put in there administrators. I'm not so sure about that. I guess we've got to have bureaucrats, I guess. I don't know. And then the First Timothy passage is much like the uh, First Corinthians passage. Uh, this has to do with Adam and Eve. This is part of God's uh, creation and was part of God's creation even before the fall, even though the fall is mentioned here. And, you know, the ladies can complain about it all they want to, and, and I don't blame them. I mean, I, you know, I don't hold it against them. Uh, people come to me, ladies come, women come to me, uh, I hate that, you know, your church is so anti-woman, you know, whatever. I said, what do you want me to do with this? I mean, really, I mean, really. I've asked people this before. Really, what do you want me to do with this? The, both these passages, the First Corinthians passage and the Timothy passage. What do you want me to do with it? I mean, really, you, 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 you get a pastor, and, and the pastor takes his oath, I'm going to preach and teach the Word of God, it's, uh, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, okay? May God strike me dead if I don't, right? That's what basic, these guys are basically saying. And then, okay, here, he reads this in Scripture, da, da, that's what God says, right? And then you come to him and you say, oh, but pastor, uh, you, I, I don't like this. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't put that in, in our rules. You can't, you can't have that. We can't do that. We have to take that out. Well, you can't have it both ways. And I'm not going to take my oath on the Bible and say I'm going to do everything in the Bible, you know, uh, so help me God. And then, uh, well, I'm just going to ignore this. I'm going to pretend it's not there. <laughs> God didn't ever say that. Well, you could just interpret it somewhat. 
Again, the grammar is the grammar, folks. Nouns are the nouns, the verbs are the verbs. Is means is. What am I going to do? Okay? Well, 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 nobody else looks at it that way. Well, fine. Let them get struck by lightning. I don't want to get struck by lightning. I don't want the earth to open up and swallow me. They're going to call me a chicken. Okay, fine. But again, you can't have it both ways. Right? You can't, you can't have it both ways. And, and, and you know, you, you start down the road, you say, well, I'm going to take this out. Okay? I'm going to take this out, I'm going to take the Corinthians out, I'm going to take the past, Timothy out, I'm going to take those out. Well, what are you going to take out next? Well, of course, you know, and in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, I've got to take that out. Can't have that, right? Now, when a man uh, lies with another man the way he lies in line with women, that is an abomination to the Lord. Oh, we've got to take that out. Can't have that in there. Oh, my goodness. You know, all the gay people would get mad at us. Okay. If you're, uh, Paul says, if you're a homosexual offender, okay, a pederast, a sodomist, there's no place for you in heaven. Oh, can't have that. Oh, got to get rid of that. Can't have that in there. Okay. Folks, I mean, really, what do you expect pastors to do? And there it is. Biggest life, black and white. I don't know. I, I, I sometimes wonder about people's brains. You know, well, we get rid of that, we'll be okay. Really? 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 I don't think so. If a man desires to be an overseer, okay, that's what you got to put up with. You want to be a pastor? You want to be a teacher? Fine. You have to learn to tell people no. That's what I tell young people today who want to be parents. You have to learn to say no to your children. Yes, it's the first word your children will repeat back to you. I know that. Mine were no different. But you not only got to say it, you got to stick to it. And if you're going to be an overseer, okay, you must be above reproach. What does that mean? That just doesn't mean that you're a holy roller. Above reproach means that you keep your word. You do what you tell people you're going to do. You stick to your guns. You're a man of integrity. Temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, able to put something across to people. That's getting harder and harder, too. Hard to teach anybody. Because you know what? Everybody's an expert now. Just, what, just the reason I said before. Just like you can go on the Internet and get all the Bible you want, you can also go on the Internet and get anything else you want. You want to learn about nuclear fission? It's all there. You want to learn about the backside of the moon? All there. You can be an expert on anything. So teaching is tough. Teaching is really hard. Okay? You get argued with a lot. You guys don't argue with me too much anymore. You've learned your lesson. But young people, young people, boy, they argue with me like crazy. I get these young whippersnappers in here for confirmation and catechism class. Whoa. So you say, Pastor, my teacher says so and so, or the internet says so and so, or YouTube says so and so, or Facebook says so and so. Yeah. It's tough. It's hard trying to teach people today. It's hard. Very hard. Very, very difficult. And the James passage, trustworthy statement. If a man aspires to be the office of overseer, it's fine work. Well, yeah, it's fine work. I enjoy it. I enjoy doing it. If I didn't enjoy doing it, I wouldn't be here at 67. I'd be retired like most of my classmates. It's a good thing, but it's, it's tough. It's, it's a lot harder than it used to be. It is. It's a lot harder than it used to be. Let's look at the questions. 39. What in our practice today is the most visible public use of the keys? What's the most public way in which you see 
uh, confession and absolution carried out public. In the liturgy, the beginning of the service, right? Which a lot of guys want to take out. A lot of people want to take out. A lot of lay people even want to take out of the service. Don't put it in the service, Pastor. You got to put that in there? Oh, man. That's the first thing people are going to hear when they come in. A poor, miserable sinner. Boy, that wording, they don't like that wording, man. Let me tell you. Poor, miserable sinner. Well, that's not the first thing they hear. It's the second thing they hear. Yeah. Well, you'd think that would be okay, but it's not. I think if they heard if they heard the second thing first, they probably like it better. But that's kind of tough to do. How is this often misunderstood by non-members who see it? I would say two ways in which it's misunderstood. The most most obvious way is when the pastor says, "I forgive you your sins." Because most of your non-members, most of your visitors, especially your first-time people, or non-Lutheran non people, they go, where does he get off saying that? Who is he to be forgiven me? Like he's holy and perfect as a driven snow? I don't think so. Right? That's the, fir that's the first misconception that people have. I'm speaking for Christ. What's the other misconception people have? Well, yeah, uh, a lot of people. Well, he, uh, boy, this does not. This does not include me. I ain't saying nothing. They can have that in the bulletin if they want to, but I, I ain't saying it. I've had people tell me that. I had people tell me that. Well, yeah, you put it in there. It doesn't mean I got to say it. I'm not so miserable. I'm not poor either, for that matter. And who are you to call me a sinner? Excuse me. Oh, wow. People get their nose out of joint easy nowadays. From whom must God's forgiveness be withheld, both privately and publicly, although publicly is not done much anymore. We'll talk about that next. From whom must Christ's, God's forgiveness be withheld? Again, the forgiveness is there. It exists. It's been taken care of by Christ's sacrifice. But you withhold the announcement, you withhold the comfort of it. Unrepentant, that's right. And I would say this, too. I would say if somebody, again, I can't read hearts, and so if somebody is contrite, you know, if I would have bumped into Judas that night, and Judas would have been weeping and threw the money on the temple floor, I would have, I would have said, well, okay, he's at least sorry for his sins. I forgive you, uh, you know. No, he still wouldn't have believed me, but. So I, I, I think I would, I would add, you know, non-repentant, I would say, I would say non, not acknowledging their sin. Not, not being sorry for it, not anything. That's, I, I'm not wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. Like this idiot guy the other day, you know, after he gets sentenced for, in court, you know, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm innocent. What? Hey, Sarith, man, you were, proven in a, you were proven guilty six ways from Sunday. Good grief. How is this done publicly? We call it excommunication, of course. Excommunication just is not done anymore. It just isn't. Why? What do you, why do you think? I mean, it's not done. Okay, that, that's kind of, yeah, I suppose that's, that's one reason, but I think it's even, there's even a better reason than that, or a more obvious, or a more... A bigger reason, I guess. Yeah, it, you, you don't want to lose members. Okay, true. But most of the time somebody gets in that situation, they're already lost anyway. I mean, <laughs> they're not coming back anyway. Yeah. 
Well, what's the excommunication supposed to do? The way it's always been taught in the Lutheran Church, in the Christian Church in general, um, it's not always practiced that way, but the way that it's the way that it originally was taught in the early church and, and in the early Reformation, the way it was taught was it's supposed to do what? And bring them back. Okay, bring them back. That's what it's supposed to do. But it doesn't do that. I have never seen a case. I've never even heard of a case. Now, in the in the old, huh? It seems to push them away. It does. They become hard headed. Yep. And then they spread the word, oh, the church is going bad. Today. Yep. They kick me out because of this. Or yep. That. Yep. I'm yep. 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 Stuff. Yep. Because yeah. Somebody well known in there and well liked or pretty well liked. Mm -hmm. You're going to do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Well, and two of the way that we practiced it in, in our church body, well, in the Missouri Synod too, always, was that the vote always had to be unanimous. And what happened to my uh, former uh, Missouri congregation in Yuma, uh, what happened to that congregation one time, <laughs> this, this guy was just a real recalcitrant sinner, and so he was excommunicated by the pastor. And or he, he, the pastor brought him up for excommunication at the voters' meeting. Um, a council agreed it, you know, and moved it on to the voters. The voters, the, the voters' meeting, big long discussion, very long, very drawn out, whatever, a lot of arguing going on. And at the voters' meeting, there was one guy, you know, who was this guy's best friend, and he said, "I'm I'm not going to vote for him to be excommunicated." And so then, then according to church practice, you have to uh, deal with that guy. And you go through all the steps of church discipline with that guy who wouldn't vote for excommunication, and then you try and excommunicate him for excommunicate him, get off, get him off the rolls, and and so then there were two or three other guys who who didn't want to excommunicate him, so they had to deal with those guys, and then there were two or three of their friends that did, and it just it it took on a life of its own. It was just it was a disaster. Well, you know that the the I think it was the district president or somebody had to come down, you know, and have this big meeting and you know and get sort everything all out, you know, and, and it was a disaster. It was an absolute mess. And and uh, uh, I'm not so sure. I you know where did that unanimous thing come from? I don't know where it came from. Uh, it was uh, I don't know, it was Walther maybe way back in the 1800s. I don't know, but it was somebody came up with it and they shoved it through all the Senate or all the church constitutions. And uh, I always objected to that. I always said that I don't find that in the Bible. I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Um, but like I said, that's the way we've practiced it. Uh, and so we've made it impossible to do. And like you say, it doesn't accomplish its goal anyway. It doesn't get people back, you know, doesn't get people to recognize their sin and come back, uh, not that, again, not that I've ever heard of, I've never even heard of a case where, where that's happened. Uh, but, you know, maybe it did back in the day, I don't know. I, you know, I think when there was only one church, obviously, when there was only one the Roman church, that was it. You know, you excommunicate somebody. I mean, a great example is King John, King John of England. He was excommunicated by the Pope. That's why they call him John Lackland, because... He was basically dethroned, and he came back and, and said to the Pope, "I'm sorry, I, I was wrong," and and you know, and and asked forgiveness, and so he got his throne back. Uh, but but you know, those those cases are few and far between. And and in a typical congregation and down with typical lay people, I like I said, I've never heard of such a thing. So, I don't know. Uh, why does this apply only to God's, uh, 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 God's forgiveness? It applies to God's forgiveness. We're not talking about our forgiveness. Why? Because our, we're supposed to forgive people anyway. And, and this is difficult, of course. This is hard. This is hard. We, we don't withhold forgiveness from people who have done us wrong and are not sorry. How do we know that from, from, from Scripture? 
We've got maybe a couple passages on that. What did Jesus say? They take your coat, shirt also. Right. Now that does not like that. Does, does that sound like people who who have who are asking for uh, forgiveness? Does that sound like people who are admitting that they're wrong? If they're wrong for taking your coat, why would they take your shirt? <laughs> right. So this does not apply in human relations. You don't excommunicate people in human relations. Okay? You forgive them, you go about your business. You let God deal with it. Okay? So that, that's, that's the difference. And I think it's important to remember that sometimes. We tend to forget that. And, and I've had uh, Christians in the past uh, members in the past and say, well, I'm not going to forgive so-and-so because he's not sorry. He's not said, he's not apologized to me. I said, so what? He's not apologized to you. He needs to apologize to God anyway. You're the least of his problems. You should forgive him and, and, and be on your way. Now, of course, you don't want to be friends with him anymore. That's your business. But you should forgive him. Uh, why must this very important distinction always be maintained? Well, I just gave you the reason. It's got to be maintained because otherwise human relations get even more difficult than they already are. And you, 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 start, you start assuming to read hearts, and you can't do that. Nobody can read hearts. You can't, you can't know for sure. Again, when it comes to the church, we're basing it on actions, and that's it. In personal relationships, it's that's harder to do. There's all kinds of interpersonal things that come up sometimes. It has a lot to do with uh, uh, these difficulties uh, that that you you can't read as well as you could uh, uh, just an out and out uh, public sin of some kind. When can and must this public withholding of forgiveness be rescinded? Well, obviously, when the person repents and comes back. If the person asks, hey, you know, I want to take communion again or, or whatever. You know, I, I, I have come to the conclusion years ago already, but I came to the conclusion that uh, uh, this, this should probably never be uh, left to the church to do uh, as a group anymore. Maybe it worked at one time, I don't know. But I have in my own ministry, uh, just in my personal ministry with individual members, I have told them. I've done it here. I've done it in my other churches. I've told them, come up to them on a Sunday morning, and I said, don't come up for communion. You come up for communion, I'm going to pass you by. Because I know of some difficulty between them and me or between them and somebody else or some public sin that they've gotten involved in. And I've said, don't. Don't, don't, don't push me. Don't try me on this, because I, I will do it. And I've yet to have anybody test me. <laughs> Maybe six, eight cases in, in 40 years, but I've, I've never had anybody test me. And usually I stop somebody on the breezeway here and I say, hey, you're, you're more than welcome to come in and worship, but don't come up for communion because I'll pass you right by. I think they knew themselves. Yeah, in every case, that has always, yes, that has always been the case. And, you know, uh, it, it usually, it, in that particular case, it, it's not public, okay? And maybe that's the key. But, but in, in those cases, it does work. I've seen it work. I've seen it work here. I've seen it work in all my other churches. I've seen it work. I've seen people, you know, turn away. Some of them get in their cars and go home, Okay. But, but I've seen it work. I've seen where, uh, you know, they'll call me or email me later or, or they'll stop by or whatever or they'll go to that other person and fix things up or whatever. And, and within a very short period of time usually, within weeks, with maybe a couple exceptions I can think of, but, but it, in, in usually a very short time, uh, these people will, will come around, you know, and they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, I goofed up and whatever and take me back. And, you know, and then, I, then I tell them, I said, all right, you're good to go, and I'll be happy to commune you from now on. 
So that works. That kind of excommunication, that kind of personal one-on-one -on -one excommunication, that works. Reading their name in the service, <laughs> that don't work no more. That don't work no more. There's a code for a new church, usually. Yeah, very often. In this process, still used in confessional Lutheran congregations today, why or why not? No, it's not. Again, the individual one may be, um, uh, you know, pastors may, other pastors may do it. I I don't know. I, I ask a couple of guys if they would, and they, ooh, no, no, they don't want to do that. Uh, uh, but, so I don't know about that. But as far as the public excommunication, I have not heard of one even being done in, ages, decades. I, I, I just don't think it's being done. And it's not being done because people don't believe in it necessarily. It's just, I think they, they just, they're like me, they just haven't seen it work. And, and, it, it's, um, and, and they're concerned that, that then they get into this unanimous thing. And that's a big reason why nobody does it, is because of that, I think. A big, big reason. I think if it wasn't, if that, if you weren't calling for unanimity, I think, uh, I think it would be okay. Any questions on thirty-nine? Oh, we, we got a, another page to go. Sorry. To whom has Christ given the responsibility to act publicly on behalf of the Christian congregation? Well, obviously the pastor, and again publicly. The qualifications. Well, you can look at the list yourself. Uh, doesn't mean he's the smartest guy in the world. Doesn't mean he's the glibest speaker. Doesn't mean he's a big joke teller. Doesn't mean he's the most personable guy in the world. Doesn't mean he's handsome. Uh, doesn't mean any of those things. Uh, he does have to be able to put a point across. He does have to be able to teach. That's true. And he does have to be willing, at least, to put in the time. How does a man become a pastor? Well, nowadays, and how, how it's been the last 150 years, 200 years, you know, you're kind of groomed. Somebody, a pastor, somebody else picks you out and says, oh, you need to go to college, you need to go to seminary, you know, whatever. Sometimes, every once in a while, some, some young person gets it in their head, hey, that's what I want to do. Usually those are sons of, of pastors, not always, but, but, but very often they are. Uh, I, I most of, a lot of my classmates were their pa their dads were were pastors and they just that's what they knew and so that's what they did. Uh, sometimes sometimes their fathers insist that's what you're going to be whether you like it or not. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't work out very well usually. Uh -huh. uh, what is a call? Huh? You become a pastor if the people choose you and you're willing to do it. Well, yeah, but I think so. I, I think I think today, or the way that we the way that we educate pastors today, the way, you, the way that we choose pastors today is all messed up, as far as I'm concerned. It's, all, it's a disaster. Um, we should we should we should sell every seminary. We should sell every college. You get rid of them all. They're all worthless. Um, the best thing to do is ask people in the churches. You know. Is this something that you think you'd like to do? And then take that guy and pick a pastor close by. Hey, are you willing to take this guy under your wing? And what can you teach him? Well, I could teach him church history. I can teach him homiletics, how to preach. I can teach him how to do a Bible class. I can teach him a whole lot of stuff. Um, there's a, a friend of mine in Phoenix. He's real good at Greek and Hebrew. He can teach him languages. There's another guy you know, uh, who, who can teach him, uh, you know, dogmatics uh, real well, uh, so on and so forth. Do that, you know, spend a year with that pastor, a year with that pastor, a year with that pastor, maybe another year somewhere, uh, being a vicar again, um, and then and then put all those guys' names in a hat, you know, and send them out. That's what I think. What? Uh, the, the, suits, the suits would not like that. The suits would not. The call is given through the congregation. Is an inner call required for this with this office? Why or why not? No, an inner call is not. Inner call is required in the Baptist church. Inner call is required in the Roman church. 
inner qualls were required in most other denominations. But in confessional Lutheran church, an inner call is not required. You don't have to feel the Spirit move you. See? Now, a lot of guys do. No, they'll tell you that. They'll tell, oh, yeah. I've been asked that many, many times. Did you have an inner call? No, I didn't. Uh, you know, my old man told me. Uh, I had a black thumb. wasn't wasn't a very good farmer, uh, and uh, uh, I was a good debater, and uh, so I wanted to go to law school. And he said, "If you become a lawyer, I'll disown you." <laughs> I go, "Oh, okay. What? Well, okay, what do I do? How, do? how else do I use my mouth?" <laughs> well, you can be a preacher. Hmm? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Why are women not normally called to be pastors? I say normally because it is hypothetically possible that you could have a situation where, uh, let's say you're in Ukraine right now, and we have Lutheran Church in Ukraine. Okay, uh, let's pre let's say that all the men in that congregation all went off to fight the war and left behind little kids and women. An old old guy. I mean, guys couldn't even stand up. They're in wheelchairs or whatever. Okay, can't, and maybe can't even talk. Okay, it is possible, theoretically, it is possible that there's nobody else to do the work. That is possible. Now, likelihood of that happening is pretty few and far between, but it is possible. That's why I say normally. Okay, because God has prescribed this. God, God has said, "This is the way I want it done. I want guys to do this work." Period. Again, how am I supposed to argue with that? I can't. It's pretty simple. All right. Didn't finish exactly. That's okay. We will combine the next two. We will do 40 and then we'll go on quickly to uh, Lord's Supper. Final question, comment? Uh, yeah. One question I have from the uh, women in the ministry. Mm -hmm. What about leading a Bible class, especially if there's nobody else to speak? Well, uh, again, uh, again, I would say theoretically, sure. Uh, that's probably even more unlikely. I, I can see even a real old guy, you know, maybe even in a wheelchair, you know, having a hard time getting around. He could probably at least ask questions and whatever. Uh, but the point is not necessarily what the job entails uh, outside of authority. That's the key. That's the point. Are you teaching... And are you teaching with authority? In other words, does the person in the front of the room have the authority to call on one person and not another person? And does that person up in the front of the room have the authority finally to say, no, you're wrong. It's time to move on. And I guarantee you, if the person in the front of the room does not do that, you have Armageddon on your hands. You've got everybody talking at once. And nobody learns anything. So don't tell me that the person in front of the room does not have authority. He better have it, or she. Whoever better have authority. Otherwise, ain't nothing going to get done. That's the point. Is it in the church or not? That's the point. It has nothing to do with teaching anywhere else or being anywhere else. At least those passages are pretty clear on that. Oh yeah, absolutely. It is. And, and nobody, nobody, nobody has authority. No, nobody says, "Hey, hey, you know, cut that out." Yeah, yeah. You better, you better have somebody with a gavel, and that he better know how to use it. Otherwise, yeah, you got a mess on your hands. Yeah. All right, gang. Thank you.